Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another 100 meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. Give them a gift they'll never forget because they'll still have it years later. American Giant makes clothes that just keep getting better with age, like their iconic full zip hoodie that's designed to last for decades because a gift they'll wear for years is a gift that keeps on giving. So be a gift-giving giant this holiday season at American-Giant.com and get 20% off your first order when you use code GRATEFULAG23. That's 20% off your first order at American-Giant.com, code GRATEFULAG23. The holidays are a time to feel and create joy. And what could be more joyous than the look on her face as she unwraps a stunning new jewelry piece from Blue Nile? How about getting 50% off your purchase? Blue Nile offers premium quality, priced below traditional retail. Their online experts are available 24-7 to answer any questions and make sure you've picked the perfect gift. For a limited time, you can get 50% off at BlueNile.com. That's 50% off at BlueNile.com. When it comes to teaching kids and teens about money, practice makes perfect. That's where Greenlight comes in. With a debit card and money app of their own, kids learn to earn, save, spend wisely, and invest. Parents send instant money transfers, create custom chores, and automate allowance, while kids track their spending, set savings goals, and practice money skills they can use today and for life. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast. Looking for a fun way to win 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash play100 and use code play100. That's code play100 at prizepicks.com slash play100 for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray, and you're listening to the Ranks FC podcast. Hello, Rank Squad, and welcome to Ranks FC. It's your favourite football podcast back for another week. And today, we're going to be taking a look around the top scorers of Europe, diving through Europe's top five leagues to make what we will of the people leading those golden boot races and inferring some fun bits and bobs across Europe. My name is Jack Collins, and I'll be your host today. And I'm joined by the rank god, Mr. Sam Tai. How are you doing, mate? Hello, mate. Very well, thank you. How are you? How was your little trip over the weekend? Yeah, good. I went to Iceland. It was all very, very exciting. I had a lovely time. Uh, picked up a new nickname, uh, which I found in a park of, of geysers. Uh, one of them was called Little Giza, which I which I'm taking as as my own, really. So that, that's that's what I've you know, sort of taken away from a wonderful trip to Iceland. A new nickname, Amazing. love it. Did you learn any Icelandic? Yeah, thank you. Apart from those two words, attack. Thank is, you. Thank you. Mm. So, <laughs> yeah, that that's it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, to be fair, everyone speaks absolutely perfect English. So it, yeah. it was one of those really weird ones where I was like. 
my Icelandic is clearly not up to scratch here. Even Lucy, who's a massive, massive polyglot, was like, I don't know any Icelandic. I was like, okay, cool. Uh, so we're going to, we'll just run with that. We just said tack. A yeah. Lot. So that was nice. But I had a really, really good time. Um, and thank you very much for asking. And of course, our transfer guru, Mr. Dean Jones. How are you doing, mate? Hello, I'm good. I was a lot warmer than you were at the weekend. So um, while you did say you were having a nice time, I was very skeptical seeing you skid around in those uh, trainers with no grip. Uh, very well at badly equipped weren't you for for a trip to a surprise trip to iceland I mean, if you're going to surprise someone for a trip to iceland you kind of need to pack their bag as well for them um uh, but yeah. you were you were yeah. kind of Lucy didn't do that. I was in my Stan Smiths. You know what? The big winners out of this weekend are Adidas and Stan Smith because I didn't stack it once, despite the fact it was an ice rink and I was wearing a, a battered pair of old trainers. <laughs> so, you know what? You know, things things you love. But it feels positively tropical back in London right now. It's quite wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm walking around in yeah. a T-shirt, shorts. You know, got the, got the whole got thing going on. I'm very shorts. happy. I think you're getting sunglasses on. <laughs> well it's a long sleeve t-shirt i'll give you that for free but it's uh it's a t-shirt and shorts combination for me to take got the sunglasses on when i go to the shops later very excited about, oh, wow. about taking a wander and but right let's get on to things we love because there's a lot of things we love this week and sam why don't you kick us off this week yeah i'm sure most people would expect me to sit here and extol the virtues of what's happening at the top of the premier league table because it's all kicking off again um, but actually, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to talk about the bottom end. Um, and I'm going to talk specifically about signs of life from Southampton, which, as you will know from me with a vested interest, is, is most welcome. And it's l- thanks largely to possibly the most swish and suave caretaker manager of all time in any sport, Ruben Sayers, who went to Stamford Bridge this weekend. And yes, he needed a little bit of luck, a couple of goal line clearances and that. But you need a bit of luck if you're going to beat Chelsea away from home. And Southampton walked out of there with three points. And, you know, as bad as Chelsea's crisis is and as horrific as this is from Chelsea's perspective, this is pretty momentous for the bottom club of the Premier League to go to Chelsea, keep a clean sheet and win 1-0. And it's a hell of a turnaround because it was only last Monday that Nathan Jones was, was sacked and Southampton then went full steam ahead for Jesse Marsh. Looked like it was done on Tuesday, 99% as it was described to me, done. Um, and then Wednesday it fell through. And so they were, okay, we've got to go Stanford Bridge with no manager. This is not how we draw it up at all. But Ruben Sayers just kind of took charge. And he's actually been there for seven or eight months now. He's now he's survived two managers in that time. Ralph Hasenhutl and then Nathan Jones, having just arrived from Copenhagen in the summer. The players love him. The club believes in him. Uh, good attack onto something Dean and I discussed here uh, on our, our Patreon podcast on Monday. He seems to have a bit of an aura about him, which you absolutely need in order to make an impression, in order to st- stimulate something, in order to command the respect of top level players. And he's had a remarkable coaching path, guys. I don't know if you've looked into him. I mean, many won't have, but he's about 40 years of age and he's coached in Greece, Russia, Azerbaijan, Denmark, Spain, and now England. He's a master's in sports and physiology from the University of Valencia. And he got his UEFA Pro license at age 25. And he's made such an impression on Southampton and such an impression on the league, I think, that not only will he probably get this job until the end of the season, but I think he's put the shivers up Leeds. And he's made Leeds appoint someone this week in Javi Gracia, who they probably weren't necessarily planning on doing until this switch happened at the weekend. Mm, they definitely weren't like they they didn't even look at appointing Grazia until after that defeat at the weekend lead so like that was the moment when they were like we've got a we need a reactor of our own here we need something to happen so they've gone out and, and reacted to it because they they would have feared for sure that Southampton have a continued bounce back here it's a bit weird that Southampton appointed Nathan Jones when they already had a better coach at the club <laughs> like that is a bit strange to me like I all I've heard is like oh yeah we really really admire him there's a lot of belief in him like well, why didn't you give him the job two months ago then? Why did we have to go through this mm. trauma of watching Nathan Jones football? Why did you put your fans through that? You could have you could have been safe by now if this guy's as good as he looks. Um, it's actually <laughs> not that big of an achievement to beat Chelsea anymore. So um, I'm going to have to argue with that. Um, anyone Oi. can beat Chelsea these days. So Behave um, yourself. 
It's true. It's true. But yeah, it's good. Don't as put well, your own but... club's achievements down. You finally beat Chelsea, lads. Come on, Fulham finally beat Chelsea. You know, you're going. Oh, it's not hard to beat Chelsea. To be fair, to be fair, enjoy it. Yeah, of course I enjoyed it. There's, there's no doubt about that. I'll always enjoy beating Chelsea. It just only happened two times in my life. But um, I'm fully aware that um, this is kind of a, a glitch in the, in the matrix, and this is. Uh, this doesn't really going to happen again. But anyway, yeah, Southampton, enjoy it. Um, they've got life in them, and they're only a few points adrift now. Like we thought, this team was dead. Three off, three off, seventeenth, right? Three yeah. off, seventeenth. It's it's on at the bottom of the Premier League, isn't it? It's it's a really really exciting scrap at the bottom. It's not exciting if you're in it. I do appreciate that, and I've been in it a lot. So <laughs> I, I'm not saying this from a, a point of view of, of yeah. not having been there before, but generally kind of from a kind of wider perspective is absolutely fascinating at the bottom biggest game of the weekend by far no matter what league or country you're in southampton against leeds oh yeah it's huge isn't it it's absolutely massive it's absolutely ridiculous. massive i have no doubt that it's going to be talked about on the spotlight this Ooh. week on our friday patreon podcast so make sure you're over there if you fancy having a listen uh, right from the bottom of one league i'm going to take us quickly to the top of another because the bundesliga title race has turned into an absolute crackerjack hasn't it it's really really exciting at the top there Bayern. Obviously lost at the weekend. Union Berlin could not take advantage of this. They drew nil-nil with bottom side Schalke. They could have jumped to the top of the Bundesliga table. But Borussia Dortmund have taken advantage with another win. And now there are three, three teams tied on 43 points at the top of the Bundesliga with 17. No, not 17. With 13 games to play. It's a 34-game season in the Bundesliga, obviously. And, yeah, it's just really, really exciting. You know, Freiburg, who are having a little resurgence of their own, are only three points behind as well, you know, on, on 40 points. And Leipzig are a point behind them on 39. Frankfurt, a point behind them on 38. There are five points separating the top six in Germany. And that's something that I didn't think we would be saying back in October, November, when we went for that break, it felt like it was another season done and dusted. Very much not so. I've been saying over the last couple of weeks, I think the Eredivisie is the most exciting title race in Europe because of the closeness of, of the top four over there. But I think the Bundesliga might have steamed ahead of it <laughs> in terms of drama at the top of the table. Look, Borussia Dortmund have a 100% record in 2023 they've won every single game or every single competitive game in 2023 so far which is pretty stunning stuff there have been some major moments in that obviously you look at some of those some of those performances and some of those wins and they've come and substitute 94th minute winners to begin with but you know after a while Dortmund have calmed down uh, Edin Terzic spoke about the fact that they needed to become a little bit less reactive and a little bit less mad if they were actually going to compete for titles they have done that over the past couple of weeks they look like a really really well drilled well oiled side union berlin we've talked about loads they might have been on a little bit of a hangover from a really really impressive performance in amsterdam against ajax in the europa league midweek where they should have won uh, talked about this a little bit on friday but felt like they were the better team they had a goal chalked off a handball I've watched it now maybe a hundred times. I still haven't decided, I haven't worked out where the handball has come from that the goal was chalked off for. They'll feel very confident going into the second leg of that one. And, you know, generally, I think this is a, a very, very interesting, very good title race. I called the bag way back for Bayern. But if it's broken by Union Berlin or Borussia Dortmund or Freiburg, I won't be that mad. Do you know what I mean? I won't, I won't be that know mad it about be. it. It feels like the kind of you know it won't be kind of what it might work. It might not be. It might not be. But at least it's incredibly exciting at the top of the Bundesliga. I don't think anyone yeah. is going to deny that. Feels yeah a little bit fake to me. Um, you never know with this challenge. <laughs> Let us dream, know. Dean. Yeah. Let us dream. Let us dream. <laughs> Poets and narratives. Poets and narratives. Right. Let's look forward, Dean. What have you got for us on? Uh, 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 MLS is back. MLS is back. This is your warning. This is the MLS, uh, yeah, warning siren. Get ready. Not that any of us can actually watch it unless you get this new subscription. This is a bit annoying. I mean, on one hand, it sounds like the coolest thing ever. On the other hand, I'm like, am I really going to pay for something else? Another way to watch football? 
in case you've missed this, the whole season for the next 10 years is now covered by Apple TV. It's an unbelievable global deal, like of the like just literally never seen before. But yeah, you need an MLS season pass now to watch all the games. Like it's cool that you could, yeah, watch literally every game through this and you get loads of other bonus content too. And there's little docs on there, which which seem like they will be cool. Um, I think it's £99 for the season, which isn't that bad. But when you're already paying for all the other leagues, it's not ideal. So I know in America, they are there's access you can get to a few other games. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case in England, but like, for example, like in America, like there's a deal with direct TV, so you can still watch games in bars and stuff like that. Um, and I think the odd game is still shown on cable channels and stuff, but, um, we'll have to wait and see here. I was, I was looking for like how I could watch this weekend and unless I've got Apple TV, not sure I can, but, um, look, it, it should end up being a good thing. We're all going to end up with Apple TV anyway. I'll probably just go and order it in about 20 minutes time. Um, and let's just remember Lads, LAFC are the reigning champions thanks to that Gareth Bale moment when he popped up to save them and deep into added time in the final. Um, and then they won on penalties against Philadelphia Union. Since then, they've lost Bale, of course. He's finally caved in and turned to golf. Um, should have probably done that a while back, but at least he gave LAFC their, their moment. LAFC have also lost Latif Blessing and Christian Arango. That's two major exits for the reigning champions. And while I still expect them to be competing in the West, you never really know on the back of a championship season what you're going to get. And I don't think it's a, a guarantee that LA are as good as they were. Um, what is going to be as good is the opening game. They've got LA Galaxy, the biggest El Trafico of our times. It's at the Rose Bowl, potentially 90,000 people at an MLS game. We'll see whether they could, uh, whether they can fill the stadium. I had a quick look before we went on to see if, you know, could I buy tickets right now for that game? The only tickets I could see were about three hundred dollars. So I'm presuming like all the all the like normal seats are taken for this game, um, and these were like fancy ones. The all-time attendance record was set last year when Charlotte had seventy-four and a half thousand for their season opener. So there's potential here to to break that. Uh, we'll have to wait and see what we get. Um, but yeah, anyway, to just address a few other teams uh, that are worth talking about, Austin FC, a, a team that a lot of people uh, believe will have a, an opportunity um, to win the Western Conference. They've put Zardes now as the focal point of their attack, which is interesting. They already had a, a nicely blended squad and a lot of people fancy that they could have a good season in the East. Look, the Uni Philadelphia Union still fancied by a lot of people. They've got a really solid foundation. Um, they shouldn't lose many games. Uh, they were they were really good at back end of last season and could really have won that final, obviously. Um, where else? Into Miami, a, a team in England that everybody just wants to know about because it's the Beckham team. Um, they got a new forward from Atlanta. One of Jack's favorites. They do. One of they Jack's do. favorites. They, yeah, Joseph they Martinez. signed Joseph Martinez, which puts an end puts an end to one of the great, well, one of the great eras, I suppose. And when yeah. you look at it and you think about the fact that him and Miguel Almiron obviously fired Atlanta to that first title right at the start of, of their kind of existence. Yeah. And, you know, that that is finally over now. Both have obviously departed Almiron a few seasons back for Newcastle United and, and now Joseph Martinez over to Inter Miami. So that is, that is exciting, I, I, I think. But I would also add that Atlanta United have replaced him with Georgios Giacomakis, who yeah. has come in from Celtic. 26 goals in 57 appearances across all competitions for Celtic. That's not bad. Mm. Not bad going whatsoever. I think Giacomakis might score an absolute binful <laughs> in MLS this season. I, I've just got a feeling that I don't know how cohesive this Atlanta side is and and that's something to, to be wary of I think you look at some of the games they've played in recently and there's a lot of sort of four threes five three madnesses and, and I wonder if they're just going to be a heap of fun but I do think Jack Mackis is going to score an absolute hatful so they're one one to watch out for there you are L lay your golden boot golden boot foundations on George's Jack Mackis early doors that that's where I'm at on it who who do I support this year I had four or five teams last year didn't I um uh, I feel uh, like well, I there's need a new to slim one. that down. There's a new one for you. What, do you fancy a new want to team? Support, I don't We've want got to a new franchise. St. Louis, no, St. Louis no, no, City. No. They are the 29th club in, in MLS. Um, I think no. we should go for them. I thought, you know, they've got uh, Roman Berkey 
He's he's in goal yes. for them uh, from Borussia Dortmund. He's captain. He's their first ever captain. So there you go. He Got signed for them about a year ago, like literally yeah. about a year ago, and it's just been like knocking around. It's going to be a bit like rusty. Waiting. <laughs> it might be a bit rusty. <laughs> <laughs> um, St. Louis is famously the the birthplace of one Tim Ream. Ah, he'll it? probably be playing so, for him this year. So I wonder if he, if that's where his Maybe. his ultimate destination will be now that there is an MLS club in St. Louis, Missouri. Well, yeah, one for maybe. Dean in particular, Dean. St. Louis is the location of Superstore it's on Netflix. Oh, so yes. Maybe, yes. maybe given I watch that over and over again, maybe go. I should pick them. Well, maybe now. watch that that first game. They've got, um, yeah, they've got Austin at the weekend, so they'll lose that. Um, but then put <laughs> Charlotte. Their, their first home match is against Charlotte, and it's at their new stadium, City Park, uh, which does look quite cool, to be fair. Um, that'll be in front of uh, a sellout 22,000. So that there you go, Sam. That's what you need to have your eye on in the first couple of weeks. Um, so yeah. watch out for that one. They're actually going to announce a 30th team, probably in the first half of this year, that will join next uh, season. Um there's three Any teams. Chances? Is that that then? Is 30, Any... is 30 the kind of top bins? Is that where we're going for? Is it, nah, is it mate, they'll never stop. getting bigger? This will never stop. They want more, <laughs> more, more money. Yeah. Um, Dean, yeah, is there but... any chance that's Detroit? Because if it's Detroit, I'll just wait a bit. No, I don't think so. Um, it's likely oh. to be San Diego or Las Vegas by the sound of it. I am rooting for San Diego um, for reasons <laughs> we'll, we'll later find out. But um, yeah, there, there is one other, t- I can't remember the other city in the mix, um, but there's there's three in the mix, but Vegas and San Diego were the ones I was reading about the other day. So yeah, very interesting. I think Landon Donovan actually behind the San Diego one too, which is interesting. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, Nashville v NYCFC, Sam's old team, is the first game of the uh, of the endless season. So look out for that one early doors. We're going to preview the El Trafico game properly on the Patreon on Friday. Uh, do come and join us over there. We like to delve into MLS every now and then over there, but this week it's definitely fitting, especially on the back of me having an absolute blinder in the Predictions League last weekend. So you can hear all about that as well if you come over to Patreon, how I'm rising again in, in the Predictions League. Um, also, just to shout out to our patrons who are literally flying across the world to meet each other. Like this is... The rank squad has hit whole new levels since we started Patreon. They have mm. people have literally become friends to the, the extent that someone has flown from America to England, stayed with people that he's got to know through the ranks community um, on Discord, and gone to watch football matches with them, and they are like best mates. That is unreal. I couldn't believe it when Sam and we were talking about this the other day. Um, but it's mad, isn't it? I mean, Sam, you're quite a big part of the Discord, whereas I'm not. But um, so you're probably not quite as surprised that this is happening. But that is a madness from the rank squad. It's still pretty surprising. <laughs> not gonna lie. <laughs> I mean, I watch, I watch, the, I watch these guys. I, I join in with these conversations on our Discord, you know, every week, or and and I see the bond that that grows between them. And I, I know that there's been meetups in the past. I know there's been some in, you know, confined to certain continents. I know that one patron from Ireland has flown over to the Midlands and met three more. So that is probably the first cross-continental one, if you want to call it a different... It's not cross-continental. <laughs> cross-continental is not Ireland and the UK. We should yeah, talk about um, this. It's yeah. across the Irish Sea. That's no, fine. Yeah, diff- yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it that. But uh, this one... Um, this one from over from California is certainly a, a fresh step in in a, in a very very brave new direction. So, fair play to all of you, and we're so pleased that we can create that community and bring you all together. Indeed, indeed. Right, that's all for our first segment and things we love. After the break, we're going to be talking about Europe's top scorers. So stick with us. <laughs> Welcome back to Ranks FC, where it's time for our main segment. I'm going to hand over to Mr. Dean Jones, who's going to play host for the main segment this week. A unique ranking this week because the ranking is already taken care of. We're looking across the five leagues at the top goal scorers from those leagues. And then we're going to come up with some hot takes in the back of it. So the ranking's done. Like, we can't do anything about this. You've either scored the goals or you haven't. And that's our one to five. So we're going to go through that list uh, from each division. And then Sam and Jack are going to 
teach us something or give us a learning that they've had um, from looking at those lists. So we'll start in the Premier League, um, where at number one is Erling Haaland, uh, 26 goals so far in the Premier League. At number two, Harry Kane on 17. Marcus Rashford um, and Ivan Tony both on 14 goals. And then behind them, uh, fifth top goal scorer, if you like, Alexander Mitrovic of Super Fulham FC. He's on 11 goals so far for the season. Uh, my hot take is that um, Mitro is the best of all of those. But you two, you know, you can have your own hot take. So. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, Okay. What's your learning from that? Okay, so straight away, what jumps out to me is that uh, there is not a single Arsenal player in that top five. Um, Saka is a little bit further down on nine, and Martin Odegaard has eight. So their strikers, who are Gabriel Jesus and Eddie and Ketia, have five and four respectively. Now, obviously, they've kind of like done half the season each. Um, or maybe just slightly skewed towards Gabi Jesus, so not necessarily expecting them to be right at the top. But I think this is a big win for my personal vindictive agenda against strikers who score goals, Um, because it's proof that the team at the very top of the table, the best team in the Premier League this season, have not needed a consistent goal-scoring number nine to be the very best. And I'm just taking it as a massive personal win. You know I don't like players that score goals. I think they're worthless. You know I love strikers who just hold the ball up and give it to others. I think they're the best. And what Arsenal was built on, more or less, particularly when it comes to Gabi Jesus, tongue-in-cheek aside here, is making sure that everybody feasts. And the fact that you've got Saka and Martin Odegaard so high up there, but no forefront pinnacle striker hogging all the chances. It's much more of a team effort. That is a team that I love. That is the type of team build that I adore and it's what I want to see. So mm. for Arsenal to be the best team in the league using that method is pretty heartwarming and I love it. Yeah. So you're saying, you know, obviously Man City are underperforming because they're not top of the league. Tottenham are horribly inconsistent. They're underperforming. But it's mainly because they've got proper goal scorers in Haaland and Kane. <laughs> and that is the biggest problem those teams have got at the moment. They just need to change that, take them out of the team. Yeah, two gigantic frauds scoring all the goals up front. Nightmare scenario. <laughs> who who needs a prolific number nine? <laughs> Goal hoggers. Look, for anybody that's actually, you know, a fresh listener to the pod, obviously this is a lot of this is a bit of a joke, but I do like strikers that offer a lot, you know, overall play, open play. I like players that 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 put put a shift in, that work hard. I like players that service their midfielders, that link play. I don't like forwards, personal perspective that just focus on scoring goals and that is his, I, and that's it. I don't like that limited scope. So when a team like Arsenal use a player like Jesus and rise to the very top and they share the goals out, that's the kind of football I love. That If I was a coach, that's what I'd aim for. So I'd love to see it succeed. I mean, I think there's something sensible in, in the madness here, in the fact that when you share goals out and you have different goal scoring threats from across the pitch, you know, whether it is deep, from Erdegaard, whether it is wide from Saka and Martinelli, you are giving yourself different opportunities to to break teams down, right? And you're able to mix up your attacking patterns in so many ways. And then we'll look at this, I'm sure, in greater depth in, in the Bundesliga. But there is something kind of that makes sense about the idea that when you do tend to create goals from various different stratagems and therefore spread those goals around a team is harder to defend against because you know you can't just double up on one person and hope for the best now this doesn't always work obviously and it it doesn't always kind of especially towards the mid and bottom tiers of leagues I think if you try to do this you're often like we haven't scored enough goals and that's actually the problem is it's often about quality as opposed to to quantity in, in in that regard and when you're trying to share them out but everyone's only got like five or six you're probably not going to be in the areas that you want to be in when you're sharing them out and everyone's on sort of 11 12 and look we saw this with Manchester City last year right when they did win the title and without an out and out goal scoring nine in inverted commas you you see how those goals were shared out amongst the team and it did it did work now whether that's actually something that can be taken onto a European stage City would argue maybe not City will argue actually the fact that Erling Haaland has come in here might be the thing that propels them to European glory whether that's at the expense of actually winning the league or not, we're, we're yet to find out. We shall see. But 
there are question marks over whether these two strategies work in tandem in terms of winning everything in Europe and, and winning the league, or if they you have to kind of use different strokes for different folks in many ways. I did want to talk about City as a kind of other takeaway from this one. And it's just the kind of idea that I don't ever want to hear questions about whether Erling Haaland can do it or not ever again. Now, there are plenty of questions you can raise, and I don't mind people looking into the kind of specifics of whether Erling Haaland's impact at City can be a negative in terms of what it brings to the table and how City have adapted in order to fit in with him. That's that's a different question, right? And, and whether City are a better side for having Erling Haaland in them or not is a relatively reasonable thing to ask at this point in the season. Or I think the, the problems go deeper than just bringing in an elite level striker. But you look at his numbers throughout his, his career. He's got 32 in goals in 31 games, I think, for, for Manchester City. He scored 86 in 89 for Borussia Dortmund, 29 in 27 for RB Salzburg. And he's got 21 in 23 for Norway. His stats stand up pretty solidly, no matter where you look at it, from the moment his senior career really sort of took flight at RB Salzburg. And actually, the questions about him are fine, but the question of whether he can put the ball in the back of the net, whether he can do it in the front, I just don't want to ever hear any of it again. And if he moves at some point to La Liga, he moves to Barcelona or, or Real Madrid, I don't want people to be like, oh, can he do it at Barcelona? Can he? I just don't want to hear it ever again. This man is a goal-scoring machine. Whether that's a net positive or a negative to a side like Manchester City, fair enough debate. But I want nothing to see whether he can whether he can do it ever again. That's my big takeaway from this goal-scoring list. Well, how did you explain that bold. double miss against Forrest then, mate? He <laughs> just played Nottingham Forest and he's missed two absolute sitters. Thought it was a gold machine. Don't make the Stone Roses made one or two bad tracks in their discography. It doesn't make them, you know, not the greatest bands of all time. It's I'm funny when he uh, when he missed those chances. I was like, oh, like um, this is getting towards the point. Look, I actually think um, from an FPL point of view, which obviously is Haaland is, is a massive thing this season. He's kind of ruined the game because everybody's had Haaland as their FPL captain. Um, it's been a bit rubbish. It's like back to when Aguero or Salah would always be captain and like not, no um, interchangeables, but. I think like for the first time we're actually seeing that change and it, it's going to make the game more interesting now. The problem is when he misses chances like that, like he did in the Community Shield at the start of the season, he tends to bite back and that's that's the thing. So I like, I'm going into like future game weeks and that thinking, right, I don't necessarily need Haaland as captain anymore because he's not scoring every single week. And for example, right now Rashford is the hottest player in the league. Like you should probably be on Rashford in that sense. But as soon as you jump off of Haaland, there is so much risk at play. So much risk. Um, so you're right. Obviously, we can't doubt him. I'm not sure anybody is, is ever going to 72 minutes per goal. I'm not sure saying he doesn't score every week is actually fair. Well, <laughs> he didn't score last week. He didn't score last week. But, um, like, you know, generally, generally, you kind of look at these games, you're like, oh, okay, in terms of what he's bringing to the table. If he scores more goals than he plays games, then that's kind of... Well, that's his aim in life, thing, isn't it? Isn't he even if they his are career really... with more goals than games. So let's see if he can do it. Question, question for you. Does Marcus Rashford end up second in this list this season? He's three behind Harry Kane, who's currently in second. He's level with Ivan Tony on 14. Does Rashford finish second, considering the streak that he's on right now? Mm, I'm not sure I'm that confident of that. Um, no, not not going for it. No. Okay. No. All right. No nibbles. I think no he'll nibbles. have a better, he'll have yes. a better season than Kane, but Kane will like somehow score two more than him. He's on just, pens. He like Kane pens will get him over that line. Like he's, it's, it's, that's just going to happen. That's that, that's probably the difference maker there for me. Um, that's right. Yeah, he's got more pens, so he. Mm. Will... Yeah. So he'll, he'll sneak okay. in. Well, the interesting right, thing let's... for me is that Salah is currently in tenth on eight goals. Mo Salah only on eight goals at this stage of the season. Like that's pretty wild. Like we were not expecting that. Let's see if he can turn the corner actually and get himself into that top five mix. Um, yeah, before the end of the season. Right. What league shall I move on to next? I've got so many to choose from. I love this game. Uh, I'm going to go to Italy actually because I think this one is a really fun talking point. Um, and actually, we've probably got the best goal scorer apart from Haaland, uh, to talk about. So um, in Serie A this season, as we know, Napoli are running away with the league and uh, kind of in line with that, Victor Ozyman is running away at the top of the charts. He is ranked at number one with 18 goals so far this season. 
Second, we've got Lautaro Martinez. He's on 13. Adam Mola Lookman of Atalanta weighs in at number three. He wasn't expecting that. Uh, Cavaradonna of Napoli. I uh, can't pronounce his full name, so I'll give that to Jack and Sam in a minute. They can uh, pick up the mental. Uh, he's at number four. And Chiro Immobile is in at number five, along with Mbala Nzola of Spezia. Um, Immobile, one of Sam's worst players in the world of, of Lazio. <laughs> I'm sure his hot take won't be about him. But um, yeah, look, we know the tale of this league so far. Napoli are head and shoulders better than anyone. Um, so what is your hot take on what we've seen, Sam? Well, looking at this list, Ossiman 18, Guevara at 10. So using those goals as a percentage of Napoli's total goals is really interesting because Ossiman at 18 goals is 32% of his team's goals. And Kvara at 10 is 18%. If you add 32 and 18 together, you get 50. Mm. What it means is that Ossiman and Kvara have scored exactly 50% of Napoli's goals this season. 28 of 56 in the league. In the league. It cements them, I think... You know, I test, sure, but statistically as well, as the deadliest duo in world football right now. And I think these charts prove it. And then you go one step further, and Kvaradona has assisted Ossiman six times directly, six goals from one to the other. It's actually one of the most fruitful partnerships as well, directly, not just in terms of the both chipping in, but them handing the ball to each other. So I'm loving this from every angle. And I think it does, Dean, tell the story of Serie A really nicely. Napoli have been absolutely dominant. From an attacking perspective, they have been absolutely insane. And these two are the reason for it. And if you put them on the pitch together, they do a lot of damage. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anyone that's going to argue with that, really, considering considering what we've seen this season. It would be very, very bold to argue that Kvaratskhelia and Osimen are not Europe's most deadly duo right now. I mean, I don't even know who you'd put in the conversation alongside them. To be, to be perfectly honest with you, De Bruyne and, and Haaland maybe, but there's there's not many who are who have the kind of duo game-breaking potential that the both of them have. I also think it's interesting that when Osimhen was out injured, Radatskelia stepped up and actually added a, a, a host more goals to his game. That's a lot of this. these goals were actually in the, in the periods where Osimhen was injured. Uh, and obviously, Gio Simeone stepped in. We saw Raspadori step in. Fine. And and both did absolutely grand in terms of actually holding the fort whilst Ossiemen wasn't available. But just generally, I, I think that when you have a player as unique and as talented and as such an all-round threat as Victor Ossiemen, you are looking at a player who could change any side for the better. And, and I don't think, as you say, Dean, right at the top, Haaland might be a slightly better goal scorer. But I don't think, aside of him, there's many number nines in Europe who currently have the, the status that Victor Osimhen has in that everybody will want him because he does such a brilliant job at everything. He, you know, he, he's such a threat in behind. He's su- such a threat with ball at feet. He's such a threat in the air. He's a smart goal scorer. He makes intelligent runs. Everything about his game right now feels on top of the world. And I just can't see that changing. And then suddenly you put in a creator with the one-on-one ability of Gradatskelia, who's going to create separation, open up space for Osimhen to thrive in. I don't think it's any wonder that the two of them are thriving as a partnership because their skills complement each other so nicely. Gradatskelia, as you call him, um, has nine assists. So I think, I think De Bruyne for Haaland is also six. So I think that in terms of like direct contributions for one another, they're on they're they're matching. Um, obviously, Haaland has has more. Well, goals. You haven't looked the other way. Has Haaland got any assists for De Bruyne? Because I think Ossiman has a couple of assists for Kvaratskhelia. I think Ossiman has like three assists in total or something, doesn't he? So he might have a couple. No, I didn't look at it the other way. I, I see it as a bit of a one way a one way street, particularly for De Bruyne to Haaland. Um, but yeah, I mean, six for this stage of the season, you know, as a combination, six or seven is about as good as it's going to get. I remember that the, the champions of this statistic directly assisting one to the other was always Thomas Muller to Lewandowski, which obviously can't happen anymore. If they're assisting each other, something's gone badly wrong. Um, but uh, they used to get about eight or nine per season, I think it was. So the gold standard here is 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 around eight or nine, which would mean that these these two combinations 
are right on track for a world-class season. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the other the other takeaway here and the one I wanted to briefly look at was Adamola Lukman, who's third in this chart, 12 goals, four assists for Atalanta, leading the way in a transitional season, we thought, for Atalanta. You know, one where they're moving away a lot from, from the old guard and, and starting to kind of create a new project under Gasparini. They obviously don't have European football to contend with this season because last year was, was a bit of a fallow year and they decided the process needed a revamp. Lookman has come in and been absolutely sensational. And and I think what's really interesting here is that he's finally turning that kind of game-breaking potential that he always had. And, you know, we talk about one-on-one separation. We talk about dribbling ability. We talk about um, the, the kind of capacity to go past a player and open a game up for your team. And Adamola Lookman has always had that capacity. He was always excellent at that. But he's turning that potential into actual output. And that's kind of scary for everyone else, as far as I'm concerned. Because when you look at Lookman's stats, you know, across the seasons, you look in the Premier League last year, he got six in 26 for Leicester City. The season before that, for Fulham, he got four goals and four assists in 34 games in pretty much a full season. We've seen him have those kind of fits and starts spells at Leipzig in, in the Bundesliga, where he never really got going. He didn't really have that much time at Everton to, to make an impact. Um, it, it felt like very much like he only got the odd game here and there in order to try and make his mark after that move from Charlton. So we're looking at a player here who, you know, he's 25 years old now. He's kind of been moved around in different positions. He's played all across the front line. We've seen him play a centre forward at times. We've seen him play as, as a kind of number 10 at times. We've seen him play all the way back in a 4-4-2 at left mid. He feels like he's finally got going properly. And this potential has been turned into such, such joy for Atalanta. And he went through these streaks. You know, we saw a little bit in, in sort of October where he, he got five goals in, in six games, October through November. And then when he came back from the international break, he was, he was benched for a game against Bologna, the Atalanta won 2-1. He came back after the re- after that, got two goals and an assist in an 8-2 win over Salernitana, got two goals and an assist in the 3 all draw with Juve, and then got a goal the week after in the get- win against Sampdoria. And you're like, oh, okay, he's back with a vengeance. And I think generally the kind of pattern of the year is that been when, when Lookman's played well, Atalanta have, have won. And I think that's that's genuinely what you can take away from this. He's gone from being that kind of player who were like, oh, he might do something interesting. He might create something for us today too. He is now a bona fide superstar in this Atalanta, in this Atalanta side. And generally, I think it's lovely to see someone like Lukman, who was kind of a bit here, there and everywhere with where he was perceived in the in the footballing world, go on to become the main man. At Atalanta, and I'm having a really, really nice time watching it. So fair play to Admiral. Every time uh, they were on uh, the 11:30 game in, here in England uh, at the weekend, which is always a joy. It's a great time mm-hmm. slot. Nothing else clashes with it. And when you you get to see oh Atalanta and it, you get to see Cope Miners, you get to see Lookman, you get to see Rasmus Hoyland. I mean, as an aside, you know, this summer if you can't afford Haaland, maybe go for Hoyland. He sounds pretty similar. And you know what? <laughs> Actually, he's about half as good uh, at putting the ball in the back of the net, having a, a great season too. So lots to love from this Atalanta reboot and Lookman's heading it up yeah right let's go on to Spain Um, yeah this is an interesting list I'm probably not going to do anyone uh, credit with actually pronouncing their name so you two can correct me afterwards uh, on any mistakes I make but at number one I won't get this one wrong it's Robert Lewandowski got that right (laughs) Robert Lewandowski (laughs) famous French striker that (laughs) <laughs> ranks, <laughs> ranks in at number one. He's got 15 goals for Barcelona so far. And he's ahead of um, the biggest, baddest striker of them all in La Liga, Karim Benzema. He's on 11 goals at the moment, Benzema. And he's not even out on his own in second place at the moment. He is joined by Jose Lu of Espanyol. Have I pronounced his name right, lads? Yeah. Yeah, well yeah. done. Oh, fine. Um, they both on 11 goals. So, yeah, Benzema's got a little bit of work to do here to get back to the top of the list. Not sure he's going to manage it. Um, behind him, so on nine goals, I'm going to draw the draw the line after nine because um, there's four people on nine goals here. Uh, Borja Iglesias at Real Betis, Iago Aspas at Celta Vigo, um, Vedat Mariki at Mallorca, 
and Alexander Sorlot at Real Sociedad. Um, so yeah, there's your there's your list. We've actually got a list of seven there in a ranking of one to five. That's how messed up La Liga is at the moment. Um, <laughs> apart from the fact that uh, yeah, it's such a jumbled a jumbled list, lads. What uh, what are you going to take away from what we're seeing goals wise in La Liga? So first of all, Dean, cheeky aside on on Hosolu, it just means his name is Jose Luis, but the Spanish can join their names sometimes to create something like that. So just bear that in mind for any any oh, name you see like that. Just his, name like is, that. his name is his name is his name is Jose Luis. Um, but anyway, my takeaway from here is that this is proper bleak, lads. <laughs> I mean, you've you've ju- you've whammed seven players into a top five and. It's probably got fewer goals in it than the Premier League's top five anyway, because everyone's stuck on nine. Um, they've only got three players in double figures. This is this is genuinely quite terrible. And La Liga has a bit of a modern reputation for being quite a low scoring league. And I think over the last couple of years, while it was people's second league, I think that energy is kind of dissipating and people are starting to move over into different areas. And I think it bears out in a very simple form goals per game and I feel like Spain kind of lacks there in a little bit and you look at someone like Mariki there from Mallorca he's in the top five he's got nine goals not even hit double figures and he's got 45 percent of his team's entire goals for the season with nine (laughs) that's like that's really poor but then I guess if you employ some critical thinking this does make sense you look at the table you look at the goal scorers you look at the top scoring teams you've got Real Madrid and Barcelona and obviously Benzema's had some injury issues this season. Lewandowski's missed three games or so suspended. Then you go a step down. <laughs> Diego Simeone, notorious defensive coach, is in charge of one of the other major teams. We've all sat here and watched Athletic Club struggle to convert that dominance into goals. And it's been very annoying at times. And even Barcelona here, who are one of the top scorers, Xavi loves a 1-0 win, doesn't he? He loves a 1-0 win. Would like nothing better. So these teams aren't really set up to score and score and score some more. So I guess it makes sense. But looking at this list, it kind of just allowed it all to fall into perspective for me as to why my love for La Liga is dipping away ever so slightly. And I think it's due to a lack of goals, something as simple as that. Yeah, I mean, I I take that in a slightly different way in that I think that this is a really heartwarming list. In, in many ways. And you take away Robert Lewandowski. But my point on this would be about perseverance with players who are written off early in their careers. And even Karen Benzema, who is widely renowned now as one of the great number nines in Europe, it's easy to forget that he was seen as second fiddle, the spare man to Cristiano and Gareth Bale in that Real Madrid front line. There were major question marks about when those two left the club or stopped playing regularly for the club, who was going to carry that goal-scoring burden because people thought that Benzema could not do that. He was the foil man. And we're seeing the kind of potential explode, finally, of those early seasons at Lyon where he was a goal-scoring menace. And, And so when you kind of take that into account and then you look further down this list, I'm actually getting a very different vibe of this from you, Sam. And I do appreciate your point. And I do think that the goal scoring element of La Liga is an issue and that goals in the league this season have been a problem. But I actually quite I see quite a lot of redemption arcs in in this list. And and I like it a lot. And you go, you know, you start with Jose Lu. He had that ill-fated spell at Newcastle United and Stoke that people will remember from the English game. It's easy to he's been a pure journeyman. He was signed for Real Madrid early on in his career, went out to Real Madrid's B team, obviously. He was joint top scorer with Alvaro Morata for that B team. How their paths have diverged since that, you know, that kind of season where they were up top together. He went off to Hoffenheim, didn't do great. Went to Frankfurt on loan, didn't do great. Went to Hanover, did okay. Went to Stoke, didn't do great. Went to Deportivo, didn't do great. Went to Newcastle, was kind of dreadful. Came back to Alaves and did really well. And then was signed by Espanyol. He is 32 years old and he is joint second with Karim Benzema in the scoring charts. You know what? If that isn't a a lesson in perseverance, then I don't know what is. And you could kind of say the same in sort of different scenarios for lots of these players. Borja Iglesias, you look at where he, he came through and 
that kind of time where he started off in, in the Tercera and, and trying to work his way up slowly. His first season, even at Betis, when he was signed from Espanyol, where he'd done well, people were like, why have we signed this guy? He's a donkey. Like, there, there was a genuine sense that Betis had wasted money signing Borja Iglesias when Ruby brought him in. He came in for 28 million euros. That's a lot, right? And, and Ruby's time at Real Betis was a disaster in many ways. He was the manager that brought Borja in. And when he left, everyone was like, we're going to have to get rid of that guy, a massive loss. And slowly he has transformed into the focal point and key man in this Betis attack. You look at Mariki, who's another one who's a major journeyman. You know, he's 28 years old, but I think he's had nine clubs uh, at this point. You look at what he did at Lazio. He got one goal in 38 games. They were like, this guy is dreadful. We need to get rid of him. He went off to Mallorca on loan, did pretty well for Mallorca. And, and this season, he's absolutely flying for them. You look at Alexander Surlot. Absolutely disparaged for that time at Crystal Palace where he didn't score in 16 league games. He went off to Leipzig. He was second fiddle. He went off to Real Sociedad to be second fiddle, remember? You look at their, you know, the, the players that they signed in order to kind of lead the line this year. And Umar Sadiq got a major injury right at the start of the season. And people were like, oh no, what are we going to do? We're going to have to rely on Alexander Serlot. And he's delivered again. And, you know, and to kind of round this off and with, with the big one of this, Iago Aspas, who is most remembered for his Premier League tenure in the fact that he did that free kick. Corner. When, not the free kick, the corner. When Chelsea played Liverpool in, in the game where Steven Gerrard slipped and, and Liverpool threw away the title, if you will. Um, but, you know, that's his big contribution. People still recall that. He went off to Sevilla on loan. Since he's gone back to Celta permanently... He scored 10 plus goals in seven consecutive seasons, and this will be the eighth. It is a remarkable turnaround. He has single handedly at points in this tenure kept Celta in La Liga. And at this point, it looks like they're going to have a much more successful and stable season this year round. He's doing it again. He is in the Spain setup. He is 35 years old now and still in the absolute form of his life. And I just wanted to use the opportunity to put a little bit of respect on Iago Aspas's name because that man has been absolutely sensational for eight straight seasons and still people are talking about a corner he took when he was 25. Like, <laughs> this, is, this is an era where we, people are remembered for one bad thing rather than the absolute success story that he has been at his hometown club. I just want to shout out Barry Aspas. Yeah, he's been awesome. Not only from the goal scoring perspective and and like the the talismanic perspective, as you say, of kind of keeping Celta in the league a couple of times, almost single handedly. But he's regularly right at the top or in the sort of top ten of like chances created, big chances created, open play chances created. Like he is an absolute creative machine and scores double figures every single year for a team who seem to battle relegation every single year. That is incredibly difficult to do to be able to put up those numbers and be able to have that amount of influence on a team that struggle year after year is truly remarkable. And they definitely would have gone down without him at least twice in the last eight years. Hell of a player. I tell you what they could do with a hell of a player is in Bundesliga because the, the ceiling is not very high uh, in in this league this season. Now, I'm going to bear in mind that like Bundesliga, they, they had a big break in their season, right? So, so maybe we have to bear that in mind as we read out these numbers because they... They had a prolonged they break games, after, right? So yeah, they've played fewer, they played fewer games. Fewer games yeah. But still, when you look at like the the goals per ninety, um, it's it's not stacking up to what the other leagues are at the moment. But fine, like, we'll take each league for its own, and this is the list that we've got as we rank them uh, from one to five. The the leading goal scorer, Nicholas Fulker, uh, has thirteen goals. 13 goals, the leading goal scorer in the division at this moment in time. Behind him by one goal, Christopher Nkunku of RB Leipzig. Then you've got uh, Marcus Turam is on an 11 along with Vincenzo Grifo, who I really don't know much about, lads, I've got to admit. Um, and then making up the rest of the list is Jamal Musiala and Randall Kolomuani. Now, it's, it's in a way, like I'm surprised about this list, it looks upside down to me. If you were to like give me this list of players and say at the start of the season, say, who do you reckon about the halfway point of Bundesliga will be the top scorers out of this lot? I'd have probably said 
based on what I knew, done like, oh, and Kunku, Musiala, and Muani, Kolo Muani, I'll go for them. But it's not. Um, so you give me your takes, guys, on on what is going on here. Well, again, I mean, I'll, I'll look at what isn't there in in the way that I did for the Premier League and say that while obviously Musiala there is in basically joint fourth place with 10, you've not got a lot of buying presence towards the top of this list. And obviously over the last like eight to 10 years, we've been pretty conditioned to see Robert Lewandowski at the top. Obviously that can't happen anymore. The question post Lewandowski was always going to be, all right, who steps in? But that wasn't how Nagelsmann was ever going to answer it. And so my takeaway here is that Nagelsmann has actually got exactly what he wanted. But whether or not it's working is a completely different question because all these Bayern players are sharing the responsibility of scoring these goals. You know, after Lewandowski, they haven't bought another one. They haven't gone and got Harry Kane or Benzema or something like that, like a, a truly elite number nine. They've gone for Nagelsmann's preferred style of everybody is a forward. Everybody ships in, which is exactly what he did at RB Leipzig, exactly what he did with Nkunku and Danny Olmo and Forsberg and all those guys. No focal striker. Everybody needs to get into double figures. If five or six of you do it, we're all chipping in. We're good. And you look at these numbers and that's kind of bearing out. Musiala has 10. Gnabry has nine. Chupo has just under that, I think eight or seven. And Sané and Mane, obviously Mane's had an injury, have six each. Mane's on a one in two ratio in the league in starts, like six in 12 or so. So this is this is exactly what he wanted. This is exactly what they brought him in for, exactly what he wanted. He has designed this team in his own image. The problem he has is that <laughs> this team in his image, has the lowest points tally at this stage of the season in like a decade. And they're in the thick of a three-way, possibly four-way title race with Dortmund. Sorry, possibly six-way, thanks very much. 18-way <laughs> title race. Most notably with Union Berlin and Borussia Dortmund, as Jack covered at the top of the show. And they're not skipping out ahead like they used to. And they don't have a player soaring towards the top of the charts in Lewandowski like they used to. And it just creates, you know, concern. It creates pressure. So Nagelsmann's probably sat there thinking, sweet, this is my team. This is what I wanted. And everybody else is going, but we used to be way better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, but it goes back to your point at the top of the Arsenal point, right? Yeah. Where you're talking about sharing goals out and it actually being a pretty sensible way of going about things in order to make sure that people find it very difficult to play against you. I think the difference here is that there is still this kind of innate tendency within Bayern at times, and we saw this in the PSG game in the Champions League last week, that they look for that player in the centre. Whereas I think Arsenal have kind of been conditioned not to look for that at this point. It's not a, a whack it into the middle and see if someone can get on the end of it quite as much as a work the ball into these areas. There is still a moment, I think, when Bayern look up and they go, oh, we'll just stick it in there. Robert will probably get on the end of it. <laughs> and he's not there anymore. And so actually what you get is the kind of weird scenario that we saw in that Champions League game against PSG where Bayern sent to the ball lows and there's just nobody in there. Mm, yeah, it was a bit weird. It was a bit weird. They, they eventually figured out that they had to cross it to the back post for the wing back, but they do sometimes look for that. I mean, look, they've put together some really good performances and we're not, we're not really doubting that. Like they were really good in the group stages, like really, really good. And those Barcelona games were very high level and they came out the right side of them. And sometimes the moves that Nagelsmann coaches to allow and release like Leoy Sané in behind or something like that, or, or to, to engineer a ball to Sadio Mane, they're absolutely genius. They're so good, but he wants to be much more varied in that sense. He wants to be able to, to score you know, six or seven different types of goal from six or seven different players, wingbacks, forwards, wingers, whatever it is. And um, yeah, this was a team. He's taken over a team and he's tried to employ that that was singularly focused on getting the ball to Lewandowski for a long, long, long time. And we're just human beings. You know, we're only human beings. We have our habits and it takes us a while sometimes to get out of those habits. And footballers are no different. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree with a lot of that. I agree with a lot. I think you're absolutely right. I just wanted to talk one more bit on this, which is about Randall Kolo Mouani, who is fifth in this chart. He's three off full Krug in top in terms of goals. He's also got 10 assists. So whereas everybody else has, you know, three, one, four, three around him, Musiala has seven, which is which is fair enough. But Colin Mouani has turned into this complete striker. And actually, if you look at the most assists and goals combined in Europe, Erling Haaland is well off in front because he scored 26 goals, which is just a ludicrous amount more than anybody else. Then there's Neymar. 
who has 13 goals, 11 assists. You look at Victor Rossi men who has 18 and three, as, as we said, and then Colin Wani, Lionel Messi, and Varad Skelia, all their level beneath them in terms of what they've what they've got as a combined goals and assists tally. I think it's pretty remarkable. You know, Colin Wani is 24 years old. He obviously made an impact on the French World Cup squad uh, that that we saw, but generally Frankfurt made this move after a good but not ludicrously good season for Nom last year where he scored 12 goals and got five assists in 36 games the season before that nine goals and eight assists in 37 you're looking at those kind of figures and going yeah good but not world shattering to have 10 goals and 10 assists in 20 games I mean the assist tally is one of those ones that People are going to have different views on, on what it is. Transfer markets say 12. The Bundesliga say 10 because they don't count penalty assists as, as, as winning penalties as assists. But fine. Whatever you look at it, I just think that his kind of continued evolution into this all-round striker at Frankfurt has been pretty much a revelation this season. And he's been so, so impressive in this Frankfurt side. We talked about it at the top, the fact that they're not miles off this title race. They're definitely in the European race for, for Champions League football again next year. Now, obviously, by the time you listen to this, they will have played Napoli in the Champions League. We would have seen Colin Moani go head-to-head directly up against Victor Ossiman uh, and Vicha Kvalaskelia. So he'll have a, an opportunity to prove himself on the stage of some of the other names that are around him in these areas in Europe. But I just think it's a really nice story and a very, very impressive return from Kola Moani, who I think generally has, has been really, really impressive in his Frankfurt side and continues to go from strength to strength. I think we're going to be talking about one of the world's best number nines within one, two years yeah. in, in Randall Kola Moani. I think it's great. Like, I haven't seen loads of him, but whenever I've seen him, and obviously he's been on the radar a lot more recently, you're like, this guy would actually fit into pretty much any league. I think that's what I like about him. Like the style of his play and like the way he scores goals, he's almost risk-free, I'd say. I, I'd, even in, for a Premier League striker, and like you're always wondering whether they could fit in. If you just want a proper all-round forward goal scorer, I think he's, I think he's absolutely fine. If I was by United, I'd just be like, just go and get him. If we can't get the others that we're looking for, I'd actually consider getting him. I, th- I think it's a good shout. Let's take this on, lads, because there's one league left. Liga. And the list of names mm. here are probably more recognisable to everybody listening to this podcast than probably all the others we've done, apart from the Premier League, maybe. like they, These are players that we're all, I think, aware of, that have been around, that are already stars or, or on the verge of being stars. So... Our ranking, one to five in Liga. We've got Kylian Mbappe heading things up. 15 goals for PSG so far this season. Now, he's actually uh, tied here. So, he is he is uh, the leading goal scorer, as they set it up here on the site. But Jonathan David at Lille and following Balogun, the Arsenal man who's at Stade Rheim, is also there on 15 goals. Now... I'll take it down a bit further, but I'm not going to go down too far here. We've got uh, Lacazette is on 14 goals. Uh, ben Yedder is all, also on 14 goals. So we've already got a list there of fine, five names. We've technically only gone through through one and two. Um, so if it's any other league, I, I probably wouldn't even bother going any deeper. I'm going to go one deeper and throw Neymar into the mix because he's on 13. Uh, and technically, he's right there. He's, he's right behind those guys. And you could say he's the third top goal scorer in the league based on uh, the fact that he could get to the top so easily. So like that list of names, I know this is known as the Farmers League. I know the, the reputation around it. But when it comes to goal scoring prowess, this league has got it. It's really got it. Yeah, I mean, the one that really jumps out to me there is Balogun. I mean, it has to be him for sure. Like, it's just, it's been such an amazing kind of breakout campaign for him. Uh, A massive, massive season. And he's got 15 goals. I mean, heading into this weekend, he was was ahead of Mbappe for goals. And obviously, Mbappe has now drawn level with him. And Lacazette's presence in the top five might make you think, well, hang on a minute, isn't it quite easy to score goals here? But we've just talked about how Kola Moani is doing better in the Bundesliga than he was in Liga. So, actually probably not the case um and with Balogun and for Arsenal they've got quite a big decision to make here this summer I think um very interesting because he's going to go back 
I'm going to go ahead and, and make a not so bold prediction that he heads back to Arsenal this summer, having scored at least 20 league goals in Liga. He's, yeah. he's got 15, so bold, <laughs> it's not particularly bold to say that he'll get to 20. He'll go back and he'll want to make that next step. And Arsenal are going to have to try and work out who is that step with, because they have their first choice in Gabriel Jesus and they love him and he fits the style perfectly. They've got Enketia, who they gave a new deal to relatively recently, and he's been a pretty solid stand-in. He doesn't really suit Arteta ball perfectly, but it's good to have a variation of different profiles of forwards. You have a lot of games to play. He's through the academy, absolutely fine standing in. And if you want to add Balogun into that rotation, I think there's no harm in that whatsoever. And I think he's their second best forward. I think he's better than Enketia. The question is, though... Do they sell him instead? Because I'm thinking, I'm, I'm just thinking here, like how many Premier League clubs, middling Premier League clubs, you know, anywhere from seventh down are going to be taking a look at this Balogun season and thinking, yeah, I'll pay 30 million for him. I'll pay 35 million for him. Like his price this summer, if they chose to sell him, could I reckon it could go 30 to 40 million based on what he's done this season, based on his age, based on his homegrown status. And Arsenal have spent a lot of money over the last couple of years and they haven't necessarily made a lot back because they've done a lot of cancelling contracts and releasing people, you know, Kolasinac and all those guys. And while they will be able to sell some players this summer, there's probably an economic element that's facing them coming up soon. It's not a crisis, but they are going to have to consider it. And if Aston Villa, for example, turn around and say, we'll give you 40 million for Balogun. What do they do? And I'm fascinated. I think Balogun's going to be one of the biggest names of the summer. Mm. Yeah, no, I think he kind of has to be, right? Mm. Considering the performances he's put in this season, considering that goal record, mm. there are going to be, everyone's going to be on high alert. Mm. You can, it, it's a very West Ham signing if they stay up, isn't it? Yeah. It's very like, oh, okay, West Ham are going to go for this. Now, obviously they have Skamaka, so question mark, question mark, question mark. But it feels like the kind of deal that West Ham would go all in on. And I, I too am intrigued by, one, how this form translates to the Premier League. Generally, strikers who have done well in France tend to do okay, mm -hmm. I think, in, in the Premier League. It's not, been a, it's not been a particularly bad transitional route for players to come into. Um, but generally, I think you look at this and think, okay, right. So how, how are we going to play this out and, and how does it play out for Flo Balogun? Um, I have made a habit of being nice to players who maybe don't get the respect that they deserve on this podcast. And I'm going to finish in the same manner in the fact that Wissam Ben Yedder is in this list again, 14 goals and see in, in 20 games in league uh, for Monaco this season. Since 2012, 13 for Toulouse in a top level league, Wissam Ben Yedder has failed to hit double figures once for Sevilla in La Liga, where he got nine. Like <laughs> he got in 2012-13, he got 15 in 34. The next season, 16 in 38, 14 in 36, then 17 in 35. That earned him that move to La Liga and Sevilla, where he got 11 in 31, then nine in 25, then 18 in 35. Monaco bought him in 2019. In the four years there. He's got 18 in 26, 20 in 37, 25 in 37, and now 14 in 20. He's got 77 goals in 120 appearances for Monaco in League R. This man continues to go from strength to strength. And I just think that generally, when, when you look at how his career has, has played out, he's one of those players that a lot of FIFA players will be like, oh, he's always been good because he was someone that, you know, on Ultimate Team, people absolutely love because he basically broke the game. But Ben Yedda, who is now 32 years old, continues to absolutely smash it every single season. And I have nothing but respect for Wissam Ben Yedda. And you add that to the fact that this now he is bringing through Elias Ben Seguir, who is starting to become a more regular strike partner for him. There's a 15-year age gap between the two players, but they seem to be loving playing with each other. He's starting to hone this next generation through uh, of Monegasque talent. Just, I, I just have major, major respect for Ben Yedda. He has gone and done it everywhere in his mm. whole career, and he continues to do it at the highest level. Yeah, I'll never forget that Ben Yedda uh, transfer to Monaco 
because I remember him saying after it was quite a lot of money. Like obviously he was a hot commodity and they paid a fair amount for him and he was unveiled. And I remember him saying that he was a boyhood Monaco fan and it was his dream to play for the club. And I remember thinking, what a load of rubbish. Like that is blatantly not true because I had just foolishly forgotten about the fact that Monaco, well, they did dip off and they got relegated and then they became very, very rich and they came back. They were once a huge institution. They're a strange club and they don't feel like the prime um, attract, attraction in Monaco, not by a long shot. They're like you know, seventh or eighth on the to-do list for any visitor. There's all, all sorts going on in Monaco and going to that very strange stadium is not part of it. But I thought there's no way you're a boyhood fan of this club. But actually, wind the clock back 20 years and they were massive and they were in Champions League mm. finals. And you place the age gap and you think, actually, no, Wissam Ben Yedda will have grown up supporting Monaco. And he has gone home and it makes it all... Very wholesome. So even stuff like bringing through a nice young striker with a 15-year age gap, he's doing it for his for the club he supported as a kid. It's actually a nice dose of warmth and um, and homecoming to what can be a very cold world football, can't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. And also, you know, he's obviously of, of Tunisian descent, and I imagine so is Ben Sagir, considering that he he holds a very similar name. So there's a nice little parallel there in. In many ways as well so i just there's a, there's a lot to like about the, <laughs> this thing so yeah you know shout out shout out the fact that that ben yedda is just still doing it at the top level my guy that was a fun list lads wasn't it that was a different way of doing a ranking we've never we've never approached something like this before well done sam give your credit where it's due it's your idea so Thanks. i'll let you have it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you man cheers <laughs> yeah Good stuff. Good stuff. Right. Uh, with that, I think it's time for us to pull this main segment to an end. After the break, we have gibberish, melon, and of course, shout out of the week. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Ranks FC. Time for our third and final part. And it starts as ever with Mr. Dean Jones. It's time for Melon of the Week. This week's Melon of the Week is. Newcastle United goalkeeper Nick Pope. I have nothing else to say. He ran out of his box. <laughs> he handballed it. It was stupid. He misses the Carabao Cup final and they might have to put Loris Carrius in goal. It's as melonish as it gets. It's as melonish. Oh, so... the, de- the amount of defence I've seen so this sorry for him. is extraordinary. It's extraordinary amount of defence. Eddie Howe even saw, saw me after the game. I think this is a bit unfair. How is it unfair, mate? He's charged out of his box. It's not unfair. It wasn't intentional that he was going to do this, but a goalkeeper instinct. As he soon does as try he, and grab the ball back. Well, as soon as he face planted <laughs> on top of the ball, he he then had the instinct yeah. to grab it because he's a goalkeeper. That's his instinct. He's going to grab things. Yeah. And he grabbed the ball and that's it. You're done. You can't do that, mate. This feels really tough on him. Like, it, I don't believe that this should leave on the red card or the melon of the week. <laughs> no, the fact that he can't play the final. That I, I like. I just don't think that that that's that the rules are quite right there. Um, <laughs> in other countries, what? in other countries, um, bans and yellow cards and reds are limited to the specific competition. So in oh, Spain, yeah, yeah. you can get a Copa del Rey booking and a Copa del Rey suspension, and it's irrespective of the league. Um, so it's not like there isn't a pretty strong precedent elsewhere. And the fact that these carry over into the FA Cup and and, and, and Carabao Cup is always felt a bit weird. Um, yeah, okay, all right, fine. Strange. I've got a question, a theoretical question for you. Are Newcastle better off without Nick Pope or Bruno Guimaraes? Because if that rule was in place, Bruno wouldn't be able to play the final, right? So That's true. it depends It depends which which is your... Po- pick your poison. That's true. Well, no, I don't... That's uh, like, I, I don't have an issue. I'm not saying like, oh... Newcastle need this player but I don't care about their competitive level I think it's a shame for him because he's been suspended for something he did in a different competition that's it's a sort of separate point um they're they're, I guess they're fortunate and not fortunate I guess Uh, but it doesn't feel right anyway we've got a a chance for a reform here I'll do next week's melon of the week now it's Loris (laughs) Carrius (laughs) <laughs> hey he's gonna drop an absolute blinder so. isn't he it's gonna, gonna, gonna be, be fair, very I hope um, there is a there's gonna be liverpool fans watching yeah this. I, I i can't i feel for him like heading into this game i do feel for him i got a bit like i hope he's strong mentally right now because you know there's if he throws one in in this game then oh mate shocker right let's move I on i mean mate uh, the spotlight could not be brighter and i, I do Couldn't. i am worried for him 
The fact that Dubravka can't play because he was at United <laughs> for the first part of the season and he'll get a medal if United win is one of the funniest things I've absolutely ever <laughs> he seen. He only gets a medal if his current team loses the cup final. It's unbelievable. The team he actually plays for. <laughs> this is, this is pure... Sensational narrative. There is narrative everywhere. This is pure I'm, Newcastle I'm, I'm United, this is, when it comes to trophies. Now, without their main goalkeeper and the backup goalkeeper only gets a medal if they lose and the third choice goalkeeper <laughs> is um ingrained in the, yeah the <laughs> the the archives of melons so um yeah let, let's see how that goes for them with Dvravka waving his medal down the Man United end and celebrating at the end of that game let's see the shout out of the week time so this week's shout out of the week goes to Andreko Malfoy um, sorry if I've done a number on your name, usually do. Um, he said, uh, he gave us a five-star review. Of course he did. Uh, he said, the ones that we need right now, hands down, the dorkiest soccer nerds in the entire galaxy. Not sure about their knowledge beyond leagues in the Milky Way. I never thought I've ha- I'd have insight into the third division in Lat- Latvia, but Jack is always able to snuff out those gems. To be fair, I don't always go back and research the lads, so Jack might just be blowing smoke, but I'm here for it. Not only have they brought insight to some FIFA career mode gems, but they also give me the ability to tell my friends, ah, yes, Zabani signed for Bournemouth. Yeah, I've known about him for nearly two years now, thanks to the Ranks FC pod. (laughs) Uh, But really, Wednesdays are an absolute joy. I look forward to each and every pod to bring knowledge, insight, and banter keep it up lads you are missing out if you are not listening to this podcast what a review that is thank you yeah, that's a cracker jack yeah that's a great one uh andreco for putting that one in and make sure you get yours in now we had a few this week there were a few so thanks to those of you that did do it um the more unique they shouts are. out to the it good crowd by the there way there are still like a few it, it good, good crowd, crowd around really yeah. in there Respect. we are perfectly happy to accept them you probably aren't going to make it into the getting the read out but we still appreciate it and it probably is less effort for you to just go and do that so thank you but if you want to get this shout out then this is the way forward um write something a bit weird or Bar funny has been set. yeah we'll be there for it absolutely absolutely right <laughs> That is the gibberish alarm, and I am teeing myself up this week, which is nice, uh, because as the boys said at the top, I spent the weekend in Iceland, and so I'm going to talk about the three things that I enjoyed most in my time in Iceland. And starting at number three, I'm going to go with the spa treatments. Now, you might not go, right, what are you going here for first? But spa treatments right up my street. I'm a big skincare guy. <laughs> love love face masks, like niamicide drops. You name it, I've got it. My cupboard has more things in it than Lucy's does. I do have I, I have a number of selfies that Jack has sent to me on my phone of him in like skin masks and stuff. Like he, this is serious. Yeah, 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 100%. Like bee venom day creams, you know, I'm, I'm I'm all over it. So a trip to the Blue Lagoon, which is well cool, by the way, is in like an old volcanic kind of crater. And there's this boiling hot water that comes through from geothermal springs and you just float around in it. It was genuinely amazing. Got myself a pint, had a lovely time. But the best bit of it was you get some face masks with it so you're in the lagoon with this kind of algae thing on your face that you you rub in and then i got a lava one as well just to you know rubbing in the kind of birthday vibes um i am having a month of birthday celebrations you'll hear more about this over the coming over the coming month but this was the kind of opening gambit of of my birthday celebrations and yeah, it was it was absolutely amazing. I had the best time. I was just there wandering around, sipping my pint with a lava mask on, feeling very, very wholesome. The sun was going down around us. Absolutely beautiful. But yeah, absolutely loved it. Um, so highly recommend spa treatments for everyone. My skin feels phenomenal. Dean, phenomenal. have you ever done a, a, a month's worth of birthday celebrations? I think I think I think Jack might genuinely rival the king's coronation. I think I think we're going to get to that point. Jack does this. He though he doesn't doesn't matter what the number is. He he just does it. He he laps it up, doesn't he? I've I've got a lot of time for it. I did do it. Yeah, when I was younger, um, younger than Jack is now, like early twenties, I would I would definitely lap things up. But no, not since turning thirty. No, no, not for a while. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, I'm, I'm enjoying it. You, know, you, you can only get these, you know, there's a few times. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna gonna ride it out for as much as I can, to be perfectly honest <laughs> with you. But enough, we'll, we'll come back to this. We're gonna have a best bits of your birthday month ranking in in a month's time. So we'll uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll circle <laughs> back round to this moment. Um, number two, uh, I'm going with the food. The food was unbelievable. So we went out for two really nice meals. Um, it was quite a busy trip. Did quite a lot of stuff so actually we only kind of went out to, to eat on two nights um, and that was kind of we had breakfast in the hotel and then we wouldn't eat for the day and then we'd go out for a nice dinner the first night just after we got there went out for an absolutely incredible steak at the Reykjavik grill house and had a beautiful sirloin but the chicken skewers that came as the starter and the bread it was like lava bread with whipped butter genuinely I think among the best things I've ever tasted that like the the salt was was got from a crater and then they bit they mix that into the bread to, to, and that's why they call it lava bread mm. um but it was unbelievable and these skewers were just off the chain the steak was absolutely phenomenal I had an incredible meal um but on the other time we went out for a meal we went to a traditional like i a restaurant that does a modern twist on a on a tasting menu and it was sort of five six courses there were things on this that i was like, i'd never eat that was like crisped cod skin and it was like a prawn cracker, but made out of cod skin. Absolutely unbelievable. There was this sort of vegetable that is seen as uh, a kind of poverty vegetable, if you will, like a bit like barley or potatoes are back home. You know, it's the kind of staple food of of the working working man. And it was just generally one of the nice. It looked like a mushroom, and I don't like mushrooms, so I was like. This is long. I don't. I don't want to eat this. I tasted it. I was like, that is one of the nicest things I've ever eaten in oh, my wow. entire life. Had uh, cod cheeks. Had a lamb sirloin. It was just spectacular. Any good for vegans? Thing. And, and uh, not really. I will give you this. It's not a country where crops are grown in any sort of great, mm. um, in any sort of great manner because the landscape's just too hard. So it's actually a very heavy meat diet. Interesting. Um, in in iceland so yeah maybe not one for any vegans listening but it was spectacular it finished off with a kind of crumbled uh, a kind of crumbled cake that was black and it had been infused with brenovic which is the local aquavit the spirit uh, and it came along with this kind of ice looking uh sort of it wasn't an ice cream it was more of a sorbet but it was just unbelievable and the whole thing was like fire and ice on one plate it was genuinely one of the best things i've ever tasted <laughs> in my entire life and i was just really 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 happy for all of it this food um, must have been so strange one, jack is struggling so much to like even remotely yeah, describe yeah. it it's like it's so it was really weird. weird it was like nothing i've ever tasted yeah it, and it was nothing i've ever tasted nothing i've ever seen that i am struggling for descriptors <laughs> and, and that is something i honestly very rarely struggle with it but it was it was just remarkable um but at number one the landscapes man it's just incredible and we went out and saw the geezers and the waterfall the whole place as you said was an ice rink and i was struggling to stand up it was freezing cold and um, we went out on the first night to try and go and see the northern lights and got absolutely nothing um there were it was the perfect conditions completely clear and afterwards they were like yeah we think that they might have actually been too active tonight so they might have missed iceland to the south you might have been able to see them in the highlands of scotland and i was like we've gone to iceland the UK, <laughs> and you're telling me the northern lights are in scotland uh, absolutely <laughs> here. um but we went back out on the on the third night and got the most remarkable viewing uh, of the northern lights it's one of those things i've talked about on the pod before the fact that when I was younger, I used to have, you know, I set out to my mum and dad when I was like six, seven, that I wanted to do some things in life. I wanted to fly on a Concorde. I wanted to go to the top of the world trade centers and look out. And I wanted to see the Northern Lights. Now, two of those things have been taken away from me by mankind. And so it was fitting that Mother Nature, so many years on, delivered on the third and final one. And I got to see the Northern Lights, a green comet <laughs> lighting up the sky. It's just... Uh, I, like, I, I, I'm not afraid to say that I put Hoppy Poller by Sigur Rós, who are an Icelandic band, that you'll know that song because it's on every Earth documentary in the entire world ever. They're one of my favorite bands growing up. And I watched the Northern Lights and I absolutely sobbed. So of course it, you was, did. it was amazing. Beautiful. Just one of the, the, one of the most incredible moments of my life. I had the most amazing time. What a strange um, bucket list. We need, to, we need to zero in on that a bit more one day. <laughs> 
yeah one day one day we'll take a look at that bucket list it was a bit weird i do appreciate that but there were the things i wanted to do um when i was like four or five like, yeah. i was like these are the things i like i remember having the northern lights was the screensaver on my computer from when i was like four when <laughs> it was like one of those things you know you're looking at the old windows yeah and and that was the, one of the the, sa- the screensavers that you could keep on and it was always mine i was like i really want to go see them one day uh, but yeah, my strange bucket list finally got a tick. Very um, strange. Two of them yeah. have been firmly crossed out. Great job, Lucy. So yeah, well done, Lucy. Yeah, I mean, Lucy's absolutely delivered. Fair play to her. Fair play to her. I had the most amazing time in Iceland. What a country. Wicked. What a country. Hmm. There we go. Right. Was everyone uh, doing that, that clap? Note, I think we should Was everyone doing that lose. clap everywhere you went? <laughs> I, you <laughs> Hands know what? I really <laughs> nearly went to a game. I very nearly went to a game on the Saturday. It was so cold. And we were like, so I was like, can we go see KR, which is the main team in Reykjavik? I think they're the most uh, successful team in Icelandic history. They wear black and white. And I was like, ah, this could be really cool. And then I worked out it was a League Cup game because the league hasn't actually started yet in Iceland. Yeah. And I was like, ah, maybe. Early rounds, so Caravel Cup so Maybe Iceland. I should have gone. Yeah. Maybe I should have gone. Maybe. It was a 6-1 victory. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we Just, shall see. That's the definition of a summer league, that, isn't it? Iceland. Yeah. Yes, definitely, definitely. You can't be playing there in the snow. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. And on that note, I think we should probably call this a day. All that's left for me to do is say thank you very much to Mr. Sam Tyler and God. Cheers, buddy. Thank you very much to our transfer guru, Mr. Dean Jones. Cheers, mate. I've been Jack Collins, Little Geezer, and this <laughs> has been Ranks FC. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you all next week. Take it easy, gang. Peace. At Kroger, you can find the highest quality products at a great price in every aisle, every day with Kroger brand. So you can stock up on your household favorites that are tried, tested, and loved by you. Because when you get the products you love at great prices, it feels like winning. Shop now, in-store, or online. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Today, we discuss Miro. Listen, when it comes to running client workshops, the dream, of course, is to get those creative juices flowing, right? But typically what ends up happening is thousands of hours get wasted because of poorly facilitated meetings. So I have Maya with me today. She's a consultant who runs Fortune 100 workshops from leadership training to team building, and she has the insider tip on what makes things work. Maya? Thank you, Jason. I've been doing this a long time. My number one tip is to bring everyone into that visual collaboration platform. So personally, I use Miro and it's completely changed how I interact with the room. You have to give people a way to feel like they're in the room, even when they're not. That's something you can do easily in Miro. Otherwise, they've seen the same slides and format a thousand times. Falling asleep, eyes glazing over, yawns, all that. Exactly. When people follow me on the Miro board, everyone is literally going on a journey with me. We're adding thoughts, we're reacting, and we're voting for the best ideas. It's great. Connective magic. I like it. That's M. M-I-R-O dot com. Hey, parents, Greenlight is here to take one big thing off your to-do list, teaching your kids about money. With a Greenlight debit card and money app of their own, kids and teens learn to earn, save, and invest. You can send money instantly, set flexible controls, and get real-time notifications of your kids' money activity. Set up chores and put allowance on autopilot to reward them for their hard work. Then learn about the world of money together. Get one month free when you sign up at greenlight.com slash podcast.